In part one, we showed the changes being made in the climate game by the IPCC, the reasons, the rationale, and support for those changes by NASA and top universities. And we showed why it is so important that the drastic elements that have been previously missed in the equation are now coming in. We discussed the different ways that cosmic particles affect the planet, and we began to describe the mechanisms of action. But there are considerable details to those interactions, and unfortunately, they are not so nice and easy as the cosmic ray penetration and electric particle cascade. For the solar wind, the path to the atmosphere is somewhat more complicated. This is part two. When the sun unleashes a solar flare and coronal mass ejection of plasma, it intensifies the solar wind and also surges high energy protons to Earth along the interplanetary magnetic field. But once these sneak past Earth's magnetic field along that connection, what happens? How does it integrate with the system? And what about that solar wind? The daily flow and the stronger CMEs. It's not exactly as simple as the compressed sun-facing side of the field sends down particles, and it is very different than the plasma penetration at the cusps, where the Birkeland current sheets can help guide the plasma into the auroral zones, where it creates the pretty northern lights. As a matter of fact, there are two other things at play here that are critical to understand. While the magnetic field blocks and deflects some solar wind, some is integrated with it directly and is carried along the magnetic fields, which in the case of the lower L-shell field arcs, interacts not with the poles, but with the parts of the world in which we live, almost down to the equator. Well, when we get hit with a CME and a geomagnetic storm occurs, they notice reverberations in the field down to ground level with VLF and ELF emissions. Recall that it is not the actual field reverberating, but it's actually the electrons caught in the field that produce that low-level electromagnetic radiation. And the extra electrons and energy levels to create those emissions are a critical sign that the actual field of Earth itself is one of the pathways to the atmosphere for those electric particles. And none of those electric interactions with the atmosphere are currently in the climate models. This topic can be easily investigated with internet searches for geomagnetic storm, ELF, or VLF, including how they think some of the human health correlations with geomagnetic storms are indeed due to those low-frequency emissions. They are getting very good at tracking the evolution of those emissions over the evolution of the geomagnetic storms, and frankly, they should be. They've had 60 years of studying it, and by the way, back when they first discovered it, even in the 60s, they fully understood how these processes contribute to atmospheric heating. What happened to have this lost from climate science and models since then, I really don't know. But we're moving on. It's the second of the pathways, and this one is a bit more complex. We described the extra particle injection, and you could probably imagine how the compressed field pushes down on the equatorial ion fountain and intensifies the circuit. More electric particles, smaller compressed circuit. That's high school logic there. But to get us from there to here is a somewhat more complex story. How the solar wind ends up affecting surface pressure, air temperature, ocean temperature, and convective atmospheric potential energy, the large-scale oscillations and modes and cells. And the answer lies in between the large-scale magnetic field of Earth and the lower atmosphere through which the primary circuit runs. It's called the ionosphere, which is the ceiling of this circuit with cloud layers, the ground, and even the mantle acting as various floors for the circuit. And that ionosphere is another shell-like structure wrapping around the planet, sitting atop the atmosphere. It is comprised of mostly ionized or electric particles, and it is segmented into these shell layers around the planet. For those who know about electric fields, these are indeed current sheet double layers. In recent years, they have detected up to the F4 layer of the ionosphere, which some are taking to mean that Earth's magnetic field has crossed a major boundary in its current weakening, but more important than how many shells we have is what they tell us about the external environment interaction with our planet. And we're off to the Sapphire Project. Little shout out to their administrative lead, Montgomery Childs, who is a great friend of mine and a great guy to know. In case you couldn't tell from the images here where they're turning up the juice, these electric current sheet double layer shells form naturally around a planet like ours in a similar space environment where tremendous induction is sustained from the solar plasma flow. Now what's going to be key here is for you to think about this in reverse. This is all about plasma pressure. When one shell gets too energized here, another bleeds out around it. 
Well, this can happen in reverse if the shells exist and something like a CME hits it from the outside. The outer shells would take the energy first, gain plasma pressure, and with it stronger from the outside, the energy has to bleed inward, down and down, shell by shell, based on how much energy is coming in from the outside. And this is actually a fairly slow process compared to the magnetic field reverberations, which can happen instantly upon impact. There is buildup time on the plasma density, and while we do indeed see Van Allen electrons shooting straight down through the shells and atmosphere in these impacts, the vast majority of what affects the pressure column is running in that shell system and is based on plasma pressure. And when it finally gets down through all the layers of the ionosphere, which basically stop at or just above the ozone, where high pressure cells sit beneath, there is a nice pathway to the ground. Indeed, we see the air descending through high pressure cells from the jet levels or higher. The different floors capacitize and accumulate, then discharge upwards in lightning, general low pressure cell circulation airflow upward, and even volcanoes and earthquakes. When the ceiling takes that energy from the outside, the effects on the ground can be fairly rapid, not quite as rapid as the magnetic field reverberations, but in polar regions, they do note changes in cloud cover and surface pressure in as little as 10 minutes after the change in the solar wind. The entire circuit ramps up because it's all part of a system. Think about a belt in your car. Not the whole belt is touching the spinning wheels at all times, but the whole thing moves together because it's a connected circuit. While the global electric circuit intensification and pressure and cloud modulation are being recognized and modeled generally, there is very much work to do on the fine detail of the ionospheric interactions and also on the kinetic and ohmic heating or joule heating effects of the electric particles, whether their path to the atmosphere is fast on the field or a crowded stampede down flights of imaginary stairs. More videos coming. Be safe, everyone.